everyone. Um, I'm Andrea Reimer. I wanted to echo the acknowledgement of the traditional and unceded homelands of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh people. Um, and to thank Carbon Talks. I mean, when you, um, well, I'm going to get into it in a bit of a minute, but um, it is tough to find places to explore new ideas, right? And, and knowing that, like, this was just, we didn't even think about, like, how obvious and natural this would be um, until we were sort of deconstructing what we were actually going to talk about and realizing that um, it's a bit of a laboratory that we're in today. Um, so I'll, I'll explain that back a bit. Um, so yesterday I realized in talking with Michael Small um, that I am very formulaic. I have never thought of myself as formulaic, um, but actually that elected officials generally um, come out to the public and say, here's a problem. Um, here's a solution that I feel passionately about, and I would like to engage you in also being passionate about the solution and work together to implement it, right? To me, that's a pretty normal arc of a speech. Um, if you were coming today to hear that, um, I'm sorry, that, that is not what I have for you today. Um, and how rare it is to create this space, right? So um, what, what I did want to bring to you um, is sort of why this matters to me, um, where the problem might be, and hopefully um, engage in a dialogue about if you see the same problem, if so, what are some of the options for solutions, and how would we continue to have this discussion? Um, so on the problem side, I mean, <laughs> climate, the climate part of this discussion, I don't, I'm hoping I don't, well, and even if I do have to convince any of you that's a problem, I'm, I have neither the time nor the interest in doing so. Um, so that's not going to happen. But we can agree that climate is a problem and it, it needs big solutions. And the solution that we have chosen at the city of Vancouver um, as sort of a vanguard is this 100% renewable strategy, that this is, um, we need to be all out of fossil fuels and therefore all in to renewable energy if we're going to have a chance at um, survival and thriving on planet Earth. Um, so that's sort of dealt with. But then if we're going to redo everything we know technically about how we produce energy, right, like where it's coming from, why wouldn't we also just take a minute to redo everything we know about who decides who creates that energy and who benefits from the creation of that energy and who could be engaged and empowered um, and have agency over this thing that actually has made the last, like the industrial revolution, this is it, right? It's coal and fossil fuel fired power that has made it all happen for us, this era that we're in. Um, and yet, most of us are pretty disconnected from that, right? We may, I mean, obviously we use it, um, obviously we, benefit from it, we may also suffer greatly from it, um, and in general we're just completely energy illiterate when it comes right down to it. Um, so we were having a, a discussion about the renewable city strategy and one of our fellow panelists, um, Betsy and I were on the panel together, talked about democratizing the electron. So this is where some of this idea comes from. We talked about climate justice and equity, um, but what if you could democratize electrons? What does that look like um, for people? Recognizing that democracy itself is imperfect, right, and could be less imperfect through things like campaign finance reform. Like, if we're going to democratize the electron, then we also need to fix the democracy that it's resting on. Um, in the U.S., this is a very textured discussion happening across many levels, um, many um, there's a, a racial issue, there's an economic issue, there's a rural, urban, suburban, peri-urban, like there are many different layers of this discussion happening. Um, in Canada, this discussion is not happening. Um, there is a discussion about climate justice that involves Aboriginal people and First Nations. Um, my personal opinion is that that's not really a discussion about climate in justice or justice, it's a discussion about justice and injustice and put the word climate or put the word housing or put the word, like put the word before it, but it's really about a larger discussion of reconciliation and justice um, for Aboriginal people. Uh, we have, I think, you know, to, it's, you know, doing some work right now on gender equality and it's always hard to talk about certain things without sounding judgmental about the inverse of it and it's certainly not intended to be judgmental but to say that I think we've also seen, uh, you know, you go to rallies and you'll see people with a fair amount of privilege talking about climate justice and that's good, that's better than us not talking about climate justice um, but the words and the action are completely disconnected um, and that is challenging, right, for the people who are trying to find their way into that discussion. Interestingly, when we were thinking about this panel, um, 
uh, and Betsy brought up Ananda's name, um, I brought up Alex's name, someone else did. As it turns out, all three of us served on the board of an organization that was known as the Labor Environmental Alliance Society, right? One of the few places these discussions have come together in the last decade, um, and subsequently Toxic Free Canada. So how funny that it's still such a narrow world that it's still the three of us up here, right? That are, <laughs> and we, we, I didn't even think about it until yesterday when I was thinking about the panel that, you know, over the course of, 15 years now, we're still a pretty narrow world that's having this discussion. It's not to say there's a massive climate discussion, a massive environmental discussion, a massive social justice discussion. So it's really a question about how do you, how do you bridge all this together? And I think, I guess that's where I wanted to end up, the final thing I wanted to say. Um, normally I would be coming to you saying, it is imperative that we bridge this, right? And here's how, and I, I, I'm looking for your support to like make this happen. There is such a massive <laughs> atmospheric imperative in climate, right? An impossible, like there's a moral imperative and there's a, a logic imperative and all these other imperatives, but there is a pretty fundamental bottom line and the atmosphere is not negotiating with us. We can sit here and talk all we want and that's just gonna keep um, getting where it's going. And there's really, to me, like I, <laughs> I am morally conflicted by whether we have time to do this properly or not, which is not, not a moment I normally have in public policy, right? So it's really, um, that's why we're here having this question. I, I can tell you as a leader who works on this, this window to make social justice and dem democratizing the electron part of this is closing pretty quick. So um, I can tell you that. I can tell you that I'm here with you if you're prepared to fight for that. Um, I'll also tell you that if I have to choose because it's just a limited amount of energy going into this, I'm going to choose climate because if we're not here as a species, um, social justice becomes a relatively irrelevant discussion. Um, but I would like to take this moment to add that extra little layer that we need um, to be able to change more than just the way we're delivering energy from point A to point B. And with that, you'll get to hear some, some people who actually, who know what they're talking about, uh, about what that might look like. Thanks. Does this mic work? Yeah. Okay, well, I'll use this mic. It's a real privilege to be on this panel with my esteemed colleagues here. And it's great that there's such an active interest in this sold out crowd. Um, literacy on this topic and active engagement by people on the ground is absolutely critical to advancing this agenda. Um, I see, oh, I see, we've sure. just integrated those slides. Um, I'm going to actually um, postulate that we don't have a choice we have to integrate equity and climate action. Um, we can't advance this agenda cost effectively without doing it because both of these imperatives are important. And I've been working around this issue for more than a decade and the concern about climate change is a thousand miles wide but it's two inches deep and we have to hitch our wagon to agendas that are already moving that are palpable and people are fundamentally concerned about and affordability is one of them um, that we, we can really cost effectively integrate this agenda on and more work has to be done and the city of Vancouver is already moving in this in this direction so I wanted to take a couple of minutes just to look at the strategic context and talk about what are the fundamental equity issues and then identify the ones that I'm actually going to speak about there's a, a critical atmospheric equity issue uh, that has to be confronted and that's why we're all here doing this work there's a renewable feedstock issue that is really critical and we already see from you know, the Renewable Fuels Directive in places like uh, the EU that there's massive socioeconomic and environment, environmental implications to the sourcing of renewable feedstocks. We need clear criteria for sourcing renewable fuels um, because it's, uh, it's undermining not even, only social conditions but environmental conditions in other parts of the world. There's an intergenerational equity issue that's critical. Um, uh, older generations, my generation, have created the problem. Um, younger generations are gonna confront it. We also can't saddle them with the debt loads of financing uh, the, the, the solutions as well as confronting the magnitude of impacts that the current generations aren't going to. And then there's affordability. And I argue that affordability, affordability and climate action fit hand in glove. Uh, when we're talking about taking action at the community level, we don't have a choice, and that's where I'm going to focus most of my discussion. Uh, let's look at the, 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 the context within Vancouver, um, looking at uh, 
uh, supply and demand of, of renewable energy, or of, of, of energy. There's about uh, 60 petajoules of energy that's consumed on an annual basis in, in Vancouver. Um, uh, 20 of those are, are renewable. The remainder are fossil fuels. Um, the most, most of that natural gas, and some of that is, uh, a significant portion is also transportation fuels, uh, 25%. The renewable energy agenda in the city of Vancouver is about ramping up renewable supply, but um, not to be confused by the title of the, uh, the agenda, it really is insightfully about reducing demand. And when we get to 2050, it's about zero carbon. And that's where the country and the world has to be going to. And the city of Vancouver is showing re real leadership in, in, in paving the way. I'd say probably with impermeable um, pavement. There's four meta strategies to advancing that agenda. Um, renewable transportation, renewable buildings, um, and then building demand side management and transportation demand side management. And I'm gonna focus as much of the discussion, in fact, most of the discussion on the D DSM challenge. I think the city has underestimated the potential for DSM. I think there's far greater influence that the city of Vancouver has on driving deep emission reductions and carbon, or say ener the energy management agenda than actually ramping up renewable um, supply, in part just because of what, what its authorities are. I'm not actively involved in this um, agenda. Um, the city is really uh, effectively, within the, the degree to it, it can influence, working on affordability. It's doing incredible work on, on the climate file. These are parallel efforts. Significant amount of work can be done to integrate them. And what's critical is that Vancouver has a critical agenda setting role in the country. Um, in the province, what happens with the building code, what happens with electric vehicles, what happens with a whole bunch of stuff, just, you know, like dominoes, um, falls across the provinces, the, the province, and it also is having an influence on the national agenda. So what happens here, in actual fact, the emissions of Vancouver don't really matter. Our challenge on climate change is going to be won and lost in Mississauga and Surrey and the township of Langley and the outskirts of Edmonton. That's where the growth is. So, moving on to part two, strategic action. The first one is basically the blue box for the single family. Um, it's um, uh, uh, retrofitting, reimagining, renovating, and rebuilding our single family uh, stock. We think of Vancouver as a multifamily um, uh, city, but it's unbelievable. Although it's 20% of the stock, when you take a look at the city of Vancouver, it is predominantly single family. And we can look at that a little bit more closely when we take a look at the zones, the districts across uh, the city of Vancouver. Everything in green and everything in, in, in uh, yellow there are single family zones. 70% of the carbon in the building stock comes from this 20% of the buildings. It exceeds all of the, the other floor space that exists. What's critically important is we've gone through some rapid demographic changes in this country. It's unbelievable, but 65% of the population of, uh, of households in Vancouver have one or two people in them. And just as a, as a force of the circumstances of what's happening in the, what's happened in the housing market, a significant share of you know, solo Sams and Joe and Jan empty nester are hanging out in the single family building stock. That's where they are. Um, they just happen by circumstance to, to be there. Many of them have moved out, but it's, it's, this is completely underutilized. There are, there are neighborhoods in the city of Vancouver that are hollowing out. Density is, a, is an issue in Vancouver. It's the de-densification of large swaths of the city. It's unbelievable. This is a resource. Like empty seats in a car is a resource that we can go after. So how do we go after it? Um, this is a typical 60s character home. We were breeding like rabbits in this era. So there's a lot of these homes in, uh, in, all, of, in all of Vancouver. Let's take a look at one of them with you know, one person in. Eight tons of GHGs on an annual basis. You do the classic BC Hydro, Fortis, City of Vancouver retrofit, you might improve performance 15%. You, know, you bring it down to 7.2 tons per person. You throw on a coach house in the back and you bring it down to four tons per person. You put in a suite um, 
whether it's stratified or whether it's a secondary suite in that home, you bring it down to two tons per person. You rebuild slightly bigger, perhaps something um, that allows incredible flexibility on a long-term basis that allows you to potentially have a secondary suite, stratify it, have a home business operation, whatever it happens to be. You can easily accommodate four people. In fact, you have more floor space than you did in the 1970s with your family. Um, but you bring it down to 0.9 tons per person. That's where we have to be moving. And what does that involve? That involves an overhaul of, all of zoning bylaws. It involves massive investment by senior levels of go government, recognizing that empty nesters can't downsize. And the reason they can't down downsize is when you spent five decades in a single family neighborhood, you don't want to move on the 20th floor. And that's the kind of housing stock that we're building. We're building towers and we're building single family, not in Vancouver, but as a whole. In, in, in Metro Vancouver and as a whole. There's a, all of this stuff in the middle, which many of these things represent, which are opportunities for cost-effectively downsizing in your own home and in your own hood. You can get 400,000, 500,000 for stratifying a coach house. That's the kind of dough that somebody in their 50s, 60s, 70s is looking for. Um, and we need massive public support, people like you. We need massive engagement across the spectrum. We're, we're moving fast. <laughs> How much dough do we spend on, on, um, on transportation in Canada out of your, 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 your uh, household revenue on an annual basis? We spend a lot of time thinking about how much we spend on housing, um, but we spend almost 20% of our income on an annual basis on transportation. As much time has to be spent thinking about transportation affordability as housing affordability. So this is the Electric Avenue agenda. So. Um, you know, a typical car, four tons of GHGs per passenger per year. Uh, an EV is just incredible. It wipes it out in jurisdictions like British Columbia with our low carbon power supply. Um, it, ultimately, uh, you know, three tenths of a ton of GH GHGs on an annual basis. A car share um, is, is uh, significantly less. If it's electrified, it's even more. This is a challenge. The most cost-effective way to move people around in, in Vancouver and Metro Vancouver is by, by diesel bus when you're looking at your own income. It's, there's no opportunity to advance the diesel bus agenda. Um, so what we need is electric buses and we need more electric rapid transit. But ultimately, um, electric vehicles are already cost competitive um, with um, uh, conventional internal combustion engine uh, vehicles. But what we have to do is ensure that the um, electric bus is a major, major procurement priority for the provincial government, for the federal government. Senior governments are so critical on this. We have to phase out subsidies to electric vehicles, ramp up support to car share, tax-free car share expenses um, for, for, for uh, car share. Um, we need the city to provide free 30-minute pass parking for um, car share in any commercial area, EVs 15 minutes free, um, residential parking passes that, are, um, uh, that provide a fee bait for EVs, and then we really need to sustain, which the city is already doing, active travel leadership. So just to sum up, um, we have to accept the problem. The city is doing that. We have to analyze, act, appraise, adapt continuously, and that involves integration. And this is a key point over and over again with the communities that I work, work with, integrate over initiate. We need to mainstream climate agenda into every department that exists, every agenda that exists. It's the only way that we're gonna advance this, this agenda. And then we gotta move on to the other um, eight steps, which is part of our 12-step carbon addiction counseling program. <laughs> Okay. All right. Do you guys want to trade seats? Okay. That might sure. be easier. Yeah. Or, yeah. Do you need to move? No, thanks, Alex. Uh, that was amazing, very enlightening. And, uh, and firstly, thanks to the forum organizers for having us here. I uh, really appreciate this opportunity. And I uh, also wanted to acknowledge uh, being on unceded Coast Salish territories. And, uh, 
And I'm glad, Andrea, that you brought up uh, the Labour Environmental Alliance Society. It, just, it all just came together for me. I was listening to Alex. It's like, oh, yeah, 20 years ago, we were part of this. And uh, it's significant in not only that, uh, that we carry on the work that we're doing in our own ways, but uh, there's history there. A lot of what was discussed back then is very relevant to this discussion. And I just think of one of the products of that discussion that I recall where the, was the just transition policy of the Canadian Labour Congress that was first discussed at this forum that people like May Burroughs and others brought, to, brought us together on that are significant building blocks of where, what the path we need to construct and are on, on our path to uh, mitigating climate change and creating an energy democracy. And, uh, and I like the reference you made, Andrea, too, the, to the fact that it is a path, that it is, uh, it is a journey. And so what I'm going to do a bit is going to take a bit of a different tack. I'm going to uh, actually resort to a bit of storytelling, uh, share a few anecdotes from my personal uh, path, and try to relate it to this issue, and, uh, and share with you some reflections on some important uh, concepts we need to consider on this path to what I would call energy democracy or climate justice. Um, I'm not very good with technology, so you'll have to bear with me while I fumble around here. Uh, firstly, so the question I came here thinking about was what is the role, what are the roles of equity, justice, and democratic process for the city of Vancouver as we move forward to in the, its energy planning uh, path and towards renewable energy? Uh, why is this discussion critical? And why do we need to discuss, bring up issues of democracy and equity? Uh, isn't discussing renewable energy or the technological pathway enough? Uh, and I would contend that uh, there's a lot more to what's going to get us there. And, uh, and, and I'll try to delve into that by saying, well, let's, let's look at climate change, not really talk about whether climate change is real or not, but really look at the other facets of climate change. Because for me, climate change is not just an ecological crisis, it is fundamentally an economic crisis. It is a crisis where, uh, to quote our friend Naomi Klein, our global economic system and our planetary ecosystem are at war, with the economic system hell-bent on destroying the latter. Uh, another colleague of ours who was marginally involved in Lee's years ago was uh, Dave Coles of the Communication Energy and Paper Workers. Um, and a couple of years ago, I heard him speak where he said uh, the system, uh, implying the system causing climate change, is not broken and does not need to be fixed. It is fundamentally flawed and, and meant to be unjust. In fact, it needs to be replaced. And I, I think that's what we really need to look at beyond and expand the horizon beyond just the metrics of greenhouse gas emissions reductions and the costs of renewable energy systems and delivery, but really looking at you know, who is uh, the system for, who is controlling the system, who's making the system, who's designing the system, and who's leading the process to get us there to a system that is in harmony with the ecological limits and constraints uh, of our planetary ecosystem. Uh, so with that, uh, one of the things I wanted to do is uh, start off with, uh, this is a slide or a little anecdote I sometimes share with students when I talk about uh, climate justice. And, uh, and again, in the context of our discussion, I'd like to put out there that there's a, to me, there's a core question that needs to be asked when we look at climate change and how we resolve the issues of climate change through solutions paths like renewable energy, uh, affordable, sustainable transportation, sustainable housing, energy efficient housing, etc. cetera. Uh, and, and the story goes something like this. Imagine you're on a beachfront. This is actually an image from uh, the 2004 tsunami in Southeast Asia. And, uh, and imagine you're on a beachfront with a couple of friends. And one of your friends happens to be uh, an ocean scientist, someone who's uh, well versed in and is researching the current trends in uh, oceanography, ocean currents, ocean trends. And your other friend is a local fisherman, uh, a child of m many generations of uh, local fishing knowledge. And you, the three of you suddenly realize that there's a wall of water approaching and that you're facing a tsunami. Your oceanographer, your ocean scientist friend, bolts in one direction and your fisherman fr friend bolts in another. Who would you follow? And that is the core question I think we are faced with today. To me, I know who I'd follow. Yeah. And when it comes to dealing with an issue as complex 
as the climate crisis, as the ecological crisis, and its interlinkages with the economic underpinnings of this crisis, I would suggest that we need to look far deeper and at a, a far more complex, holistic analysis of how to address this issue than what the UNFCCC or all the intergovernmental agencies in the world have provided us to date. That, that is what, to me, defines climate justice. It is looking to knowledge systems that are older, that are more based in communities, that are more based in deeper understandings of ecological systems that sustain us, uh, that can provide us the pathway into determining then what are the systems we need to save this planet and all its peoples. I won't touch much on equity. I think, uh, I think this slide to me actually really tells it all. Uh, someone showed me the slide a little while ago, uh, someone else's presentation. But really, there is a difference between equity and equality. And, uh, and the first two frames like, really depicts that, really looking at historic inequities, looking at uh, how do we level the playing field before we even get to uh, determining how you uh, implement measures where you know, people are... Uh, People have to pay or people uh, get the economic benefits according to their historic needs and, uh, and the disparity uh, between their situations. But the reality, as we know, is, is far different. And I, I think I'd, I'd contend that the history of environmental justice in this country is not much different than in a lot of other places. It's only that we have uh, perhaps chosen to neglect it, despite you know, the progressive nature of our society. And I want to acknowledge that the fact that our city just really publicly acknowledged institutionally acknowledge the fact that First Nations have a different political, inherent political status to determining the use of our natural resources and stewarding our natural resources, I think is an indicator of the progress and, and the privilege of that progress that we have in the city. But I think along with that privilege comes, you know, I think an additional burden of really taking, going far beyond, you know, uh, the needs uh, or the status quo. How can we go beyond the the status quo or the best practices in democratic process and really show the world that we can not only be the greenest city, but actually also are on that pathway to being the most just and the most equitable city. Uh, I won't touch on this much. The, one of the things uh, I'll, I've been, over the last 10 years, working closely with a network of what I call frontline community organizations, communities that actually live next to the coal power plants, the uranium mines, the waste incinerators, the toxic landfill sites, communities are, that are defined by historic inequities, communities that are, uh, have a, you know, racial, racial and uh, uh, attributes. Uh, you know, they, they are oftentimes indigenous, African-American, Latino, people of color communities, new immigrant communities, and working class communities that uh, have been disproportionately burdened by the industries causing climate change uh, and also receiving uh, uh, disproportionately less benefits from the economic systems that are perpetrating, you know, the ecological justice, injustices in their community. And over the last, actually ironically, simultaneous to the evol evolution of the Labour Environmental uh, Alliance and a lot of the discussion around just transition in Canada, the environmental justice movement in the US really kind of emerged with sets of principles and guidelines and strategies for really addressing these issues of inequity and justice. Uh, that's all I'll say for that. I, out of that movement, however, emerged this notion of climate justice, the notion that the communities on the front lines of this global ecological crisis that benefit the least from the economic systems driving the crisis, but are burdened the most by the, uh, the environmental harm uh, and the pollution caused by this system, uh, have the most to say, have actually been cultivating local living solutions to this crisis that the rest of the world isn't aware of. That really needs to be the front and center of our discussion. This has been the sort of thinking that has led into a lot of, in the last five years, a lot of the new movement uh, negotiations around uh, what does the climate movement look like, including the negotiations around the People's Climate March a couple of years ago as to how do we articulate a common platform for change. And one of the banners, that's from the People's Climate March, that uh, we chose to really articulate the platform because we, right off the bat, we knew that we could not possibly, within six months, uh, create a, uh, agree to a platform that 3,000 international NGOs and environmental justice groups and labor unions would sign before the march, but we agreed to a narrative that defined our platform. And the first banner that went up read, front lines of the crisis at the forefront of change. 
recognizing that the people the world leaders should be listening to most are the poorest communities on the front lines of the crisis. They not only have the most to lose, but they have the most to offer us in terms of local, indigenous, place-based knowledge that will avert, uh, that lead us out of this ecological crisis. Time, okay. So, I'll just uh, touch through a few examples. Uh, this has been an emergent dialogue amongst multiple communities on the front lines of this crisis. This is a community in the US Southwest, uh, led by a coalition of Navajo and Hopi youth that formed the Black Mesa Water Coalition in a heavily coal-dominated uh, region uh, of the US, where coal mining and coal energy has really dominated the landscape. And their aspirations to move away from coal, move, move away uh, from coal towards power without pollution, towards energy without injustice, has really framed a lot of their articulation for that pathway towards a new energy economy. Uh, there's a story, and I, I should share this, that is really critical. I, it changed my perspective about a dozen years ago, uh, a, a number of Navajo elders uh, shared, is that coal is not only important to keep in the ground, not just for the atmospheric pollution that we're causing, but for its role in the ground, because coal is Mother Earth's liver. According to Navajo tradition, all these uh, mineral deposits have critical functions, under subterranean critical functions, and coal fundamentally filters all the aquifers, including the giant body uh, of water called the Navajo Aquifer that currently feeds Flagstaff and Phoenix and Tucson and a number of other uh, cities in Arizona. Coal has a purpose, a subterranean purpose, an ecological purpose that modern science hasn't even begun to understand yet, but the Navajo know it. And that's why we need to look to that kind of knowledge to understand what those ecological functions are, to understand what the pathways then are to avert uh, the climate crisis by keeping coal in the hole, by keeping oil in the soil, and keeping at all, all the fossil fuels in the ground. Uh, similarly, there's other communities uh, trying to prevent the burning of waste for energy by replacing it with zero waste systems, replacing coal systems in Appalachia by, with clean energy and wind uh, systems that are adequate, local, and abundant, and need to be community controlled. Uh, in this site, uh, there's currently an attempt to create an energy cooperative whereby ex-miners, coal miners, and their families can pay into a system that creates a regional cooperative uh, of utility systems. And of course, in our backyard, you know, the question around uh, choices such as LNG as a bridging fuel, these are choices that I think we need to pay heed to, because as much as climate science may show us that there are incremental reductions, there's some huge challenges, as people in this room probably know, that uh, uh, are embodied in uh, just substituting one fossil fuel with another. Um, Ultimately, whatever the pathway we choose, I think, has to be done in synchronicity with, uh, with people on the ground, between the people representing the workforces that are currently uh, involved in the current energy systems, but need whose leadership and technological expertise we need uh, to bail us out, as well as the communities living on the front lines of the cr crisis. And this slide is, again, from the People's Climate March, where we had con uh, convinced the AFL, CIO, and the SEIU to join us, was around the premise that while the leadership of this movement and this pathway of change has to be rooted in the communities most impacted, we also need the leadership of the working class, of the men and women who work in the current industrial system, whose technological expertise we need to build the new, to build the new economy. And so this is, I'd put uh, before you that in our pathway to determining a truly deep transformative change with our energy system, that the collaboration of communities, uh, the poor, and the various unions representing the workers who uh, need to tra transition us out of uh, fossil fuel regimes into wind and solar and hydro uh, projects is, is critical uh, as part of this uh, system. So with that, I, I, I would uh, close by saying I think there's a lot of systems we need to consider. Uh, there's, uh, there's been more elaborate definitions of uh, energy democracy. A lot of them involve uh, principles, because just as movements are guided by principles, protocols, and practices, I think policymakers need to start, I think, embracing some of those movement concepts as a first step, a precursory step for determining, you know, what are the appropriate pathways towards renewable energy. And, and I, I know the city of Vancouver actually probably does this better than most other cities, but I'd say there's uh, an extra step that can be taken so that we can ensure that a durable renewable energy is, is guided bottom-up.
So we knew that was going to be jam-packed. So we'll just uh, we'll try to do some quick questions from uh, Andrea, and then we'll move out into the audience. So get your questions ready. Do you have anything that you want to talk to them specifically about, or do you want to? Oh, there's so much that I could <laughs> ask about. Um, you know, in the interest of time, if you guys are okay with it, I wouldn't mind jumping into the audience. Is that yes. that works? Okay, because I have okay. their phone numbers and emails, and um, I would love to hear from all these folks. Great. Do we have some initial questions? Everyone's just digesting. Yes, sir. Hi, um, Laurie Rimmer. Um Look, a question for Alex, or a question for everyone. Um, look, I love the model of the 1960s house transformation, etc., and um, that pretty clearly shows that often we're putting the wrong focus on, you know, where to make impact. Like a lot of focus on efficiency and change your furnace and turn off the lights for three three seconds a day, when really it's about transforming how we use that space for the benefit of a whole lot of people. So, um, how do you see maybe some um, uh, um, prototypes, if you like, some regions in the city where you can actually start doing that, show that it works, etc., and then use that as a model for extending. Because if you try and tackle the whole city, um, a lot of people, there's going to be a lot of naysayers, but if you can get some um, example communities, have you, can you comment on that? Uh -huh. just, just before, we'll, I'll just get a second sure. question, and then um, I think there was somebody just behind, and we'll keep the mic there. Hi, my name is Christine, and I'm very concerned about British Columbia. Um, and, and all Canada, and I know um, we have to do uh, taking a concrete actions, and it is a huge priority for the Prime Minister to change the global warming temperature here. Uh, we, we have seen a huge flooding in Alberta and Manitoba. Uh, we have seen a wildfire in BC and the Prince Edward Islands shrink by the average of 28 centimeter every single year. And the Arctic, we have the permafrost melting. There is a growing consensus that we absolutely need to act, and quickly. Canada, that are going to cost us a billion of dollars, the cost of inactions is huge. So we have to get together and do something and maybe uh, reduce the uh, cars, traffic control cars with fuel. In Quebec, they already start the electric cars for taxi driver. So here in BC, we have, have, have to do something. Specific question for cities in this in this context, or uh, I think we. We agree that there's a, an urgency to it. I'm just wondering if there's a, a, speci <laughs> a specific question for this panel that you have. For BC? For, uh, for Vancouver? Specifically Vancouver and its energy. Well, for Vancouver, we have a huge, uh, we have to take a huge action here. Uh, we have to get all the, all the citizens here all together and take actions. And uh, I, it's very emergency. We have to plant more trees. We have to reduce the core exhaust. Uh, the carbon dioxide. We have two million here. It's uh, very condensed. It's lots of building blocks, and we have to save the energy uh, for a solar panel. Um, it's lots to do. Yeah. The wind power, but I don't see any change yet. Okay. Thank we you. have to convince the mayor also in Great. BC here. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, absolutely. There's lots of urgency around that. Do you want to address the first question, then, Alex? Do you want to move into that? Sure. It, you, you hit it on the, the, the nail on the head in that um, a variety of metrics are really important to understand how we effectively advance the carbon management and energy management. And occupancy is a critical one. Floor space is another one. You know, we have to think inside the box. We have to think outside the box. Our problem is, is we only think of the box. Um, and we have to think of all of it. And uh, where are the precedents? Uh, the precedents actually already exist. As a result of market forces, um, there's a huge amount of stratification of single detached homes that, is ha that has happened to a certain extent um, in Vancouver uh, just because of affordability imperatives. There's no other uh, jurisdiction in Canada that has 40% secondary suites and single family building stock. That's, that's what we, we have in the city of Vancouver today. But we can go much more, uh, much deeper than that. And you know, the coach houses, all of that is going on. I think what you're uh, 
astutely acknowledging is that we have to go further and deeper. And you may be right that it does happen on a neighborhood basis. Tara Stafford from West Vancouver is doing that stuff on a, na on a neighborhood hood, hood basis. And you know, I've served them, and some of this uh, analysis comes from them. I, I do think that through a neighborhood planning process, because we need neighborhood uh, uh, support we need support from seniors organizations. There's a lot of outreach and engagement that has to happen, as well as just public support, people coming out saying this is absolutely critical for affordability, for downsizing, for climate. Any other comments on these? Okay. Um, I'll just, I'll, I'll go to you, sir, in the back, and um, Shauna. Sure. Angela, will just bring you the mic there. Yeah. Hello, uh, thanks, oh, right. A lot of the emissions that you showed, Alex, um, for the city of Vancouver relate to heating buildings, natural yes. gas, I'm assuming. What are some of the approaches that you're proposing or looking at for fuel switching or alternately, you know, maybe even getting people to switch back to electric heaters or something of that sort? Uh, I, can, I can see how one can um, uh, eventually switch over the uh, transportation emissions, uh, but would we need more district heating, more other other tools to do fuel switching on the building stock, on the uh, on the built environment? And do you want to take it to Shana yeah. or this gentleman? Yeah. Um, the question to uh, Alex. Uh, this is, uh, my name is Matthew Yoshitake. Um I'm a, on a private sector energy efficiencies for the buildings. Um, the the solution uh, you mentioned that, uh, that those uh, homes, the big homes, uh, leaving a few people uh, moving to the, if they don't want to uh, move to uh, high rise buildings, then uh, what's the solution, uh, the density? Um, <clears throat> I want to hear about uh, your solution for that. Hi, this is a question really for you, Andrea. Um, with the Mayor's Task Force on Affordable Housing and the recent work on housing, what there were a number of different forms suggested, not unlike what Alex is talking about. What actions is, are the, the staff of the City of Vancouver taking to ensure that the renewable city strategy is embedded in the housing strategy? So what, what can we expect to see around the affordability issues with respect to both decreasing de demand, maybe the emergence of passive housing, um, and addressing uh, the transitions in, in, in fuel sources for heating and cooling? Shauna never throws softballs. Um, <laughs> do you, does everyone recall the questions? Um, okay, uh, who wants to start with the fuel switching mm -hmm. question? So I'm gonna jump I think actually okay. you should, yeah. yeah. Um, so, um, some technical questions around the renewable energy strategy. Um, to say that at a meta level, um, the renewable energy strategy really looks at, as Alex was pointing out, I mean, the vast majority of new renewables are going to come from energy efficiency. Like, the, it's sort of a weird, it's not a fuel, it's a lack of needing fuel, right? So it's gonna come from retrofits, it's gonna come from reducing um, built form that reduces the amount of vehicle kilometers that you need to travel. Um, it's gonna come from a variety of sources. And then the energy itself, the smartest way to put it in, the most cost-effective way really is district energy. But the question is, who owns that, right? Because if it's democratized, um, that's gonna take a lot longer than the private sector coming in and owning it. And that's where I run into this moral dilemma. Like, do we, I, I sort of, Christine, your passion and your urgency. I mean, it's like there's a bomb in the middle of the room and we're trying to decide whether we should set up a committee to defuse it or, you know, like it's really, and we're all gonna die if this bomb goes off, right? It's not, it, the bomb does not care um, how much we make or what color we are or how unjust things are. It just like, that's sort of this atmosphere comparative um, and where I find it um, really challenging. So affordable housing, to bring it back to Shauna's point and a bit to what Matthew was talking about, um, Affordable housing is quite democratized. We are very attached to the concept of very robust community engagement around planning care. I mean, that has been a deterrent to other forms of housing, right? That, that attachment to a belief that neighborhoods should have the right to choose their future and secure their tenure has led to built form that does not 
provide for the kind of energy efficiency um, and, and built form that we know would be better for the climate, right? And that's where this is a very challenging, difficult discussion. Regardless of our ethics around it and the morals and the values we hold, um, what's more important, diffusing the bomb or you know, the reasons we want to diffuse the bomb, which are humanity, how we relate to each other. And that, that's, we probably have even less time for that kind of philosophical navel gazing, but that really is the nub of the question about how you mesh the values we're bringing into affordable housing discussions with the, the atmosphere comparative. Just really briefly on the fuel switching, particularly in that single family stock, because it's not amenable to district energy. Um, not even in Scandinavia it isn't. It's just not cost effective. But there are small scale renewables. Um, there's heat pump technologies that are critical. The, the, and that's geo, you know, every single school, um, playing field, every playing field could potentially become a geo field, right? Um, we can have uh, air, air heat pumps, air to air uh, heat exchangers. There's um, PV is so much more competitive than solar thermal now. It's unbelievable. It's being used for, for heating purposes just because of the incredible advances. And we're going to see more of those things as we move off into the future. Um, but it is, it's going to be, that that is going to be our, our biggest challenge. Vis-a-vis, um, -vis, you know, what do we do around um, you know, one or two people living in single family homes, ultimately the market decides, individuals decide that. What we have to do is create market options. Some, not all, but some of our housing crisis, not just in Vancouver, but broadly, is as a result of not creating market choices for individual homeowners. Um, and it's, that has different permutations in different places. So we have to diversify the marketplace. Like, it, you know, a single family homeowner should be able to do more stuff on their lot that fits inside the character of that neighborhood. But that's something we need, we need to advance. We need to um, uh, keep our high rises focused on our rapid transit stations, but we need a whole bunch of six story, seven story, eight story wood frames, uh, wood, wood construction. It's the lowest cost to build of any type of housing stock. It's the lowest carbon. There's very little of that product um, that exists. BC should stop exporting wood pellets to Scandinavia, and we should be exporting, you know, passive homes, six-story passive homes, you know, built on mills that have been closed down across British Columbia. Um, that's what we should be doing. Our, our forest products industry is going into the toilet uh, because we don't have, we, we've, we've lost 75 years of, of uh, timber uh, exports to the, to the United States, the pine bark beetle. That's how significant the impacts of climate change are right now. 75 years of timber. It's just unbelievable. We should be adding huge amount of value to the timber that we have remaining. And this is about building bridges between rural areas and big cities. No, that's great. I'd, I'd like to build on something Andrea just reflected on. And I think one of the fundamental problems that we have is results from a top-down approach to planning and that uh, results in what I call carbon reductionism. And even in the world of climate advocacy, uh, one of the challenges we've faced when you look, take a carbon reductionist approach is looking at the big chunks of greenhouse gas emissions reductions. We've focused our attention on renewable energy, tra reducing transportation fuels, and energy efficiency. And that is fundamentally flawed because a more systems change mm -hmm approach rather than a symptoms fix approach would be to look at the entire economic system and all the drivers of what is it that is causing the demand for these transportation fuels energies and uh, you know and where are the losses taking place and thinking outside the box which I really appreciate listening to Alex it's, it's, it's really brilliant but requires us to draw our attention to all the various systems the food systems the waste systems the water systems and if you do it then and actually it was a California EPA slide I once saw that really was a aha moment for me where they said 48% of greenhouse gas emissions from electricity and fuels are associated with the production of goods. If we deal with consumption and production and looking at how do we create localized closed loop economic systems, you're going to be addressing a big chunk of those greenhouse gas emissions. That's the first step. So I would contend before energy efficiency, before renewable energy, we, start, we need to start off with re energy conservation as a first system step towards really reduce, uh, figuring out how do we reduce demand. And sort of like zero waste proponents know that you start off with reduce before you get to reuse and recycle. You need to start off with reduce on the energy consumption side before you, uh, uh, before you get to the rest. That's great. Uh, I see 
Uh, two more hands up, um, and I think that, that we're probably at the limit there. Where's Angela? Oh, <coughs> this gentleman over here. Thank you. Is this on? Yes, good. Um, my question is more towards the bigger picture plan and the part that Vancouver can play. Um, I think we're doing some great stuff in moving in the right direction, but it's very reactive. And uh, you speak about planning, but to be quite honest, I don't perceive that there is a national energy plan. There is no way that I can see that someone has mapped out how we get to 2050 without still producing carbon into the atmosphere. So um, my request or suggestion is that Councillor Reimer, you speak to the mayor to take the lead on this national issue and further a national energy plan showing how we reduce carbon and get onto renewables. If you have a comment, I'd be pleased to hear it. Thank you. I'll just give Michael. I'll just make this briefly as a comment. Um, and uh, I'll just direct this at, I won't direct this at Andrea because I'm sure she's it's already on her mind, but in Alex and, and, and frankly, any SFU students or other students in the room, this is a really rich area for research and mm -hmm. the application of the implementation, the challenge that's facing decision makers like Councillor Reimer which is you do not want your renewable energy strategy to further exacerbate the burdens of poverty and you want to make sure that the cost of transition that we'll all have to bear are not excessively placed on the poorest. Uh, that's been true in areas where energy is produced but it's also absolutely true in areas where energy is consumed and to the degree going forward where people who have the time who are researchers who want to do a mapping of as the renewable energy strategy is rolled out, how does that affect people by income category? You've already demonstrated that on your housing stock, but it'd be true good for transportation and electricity mm -hmm. consumption. Uh, that would be a very valuable input to the citizenry at large and to mm -hmm. success of Vancouver City Council. Yeah, right. I'll stop there. Great topic for a thesis, somebody out there. Do you want to just close it up this yeah. way? Oh, I, no, this has been a really rich uh, discussion, so thank you. Um, one of the things I, I really actually, it's interesting talking about fuels, so one thing that jumps out at me, because I, I personally believe renewable fuels, kind of like military intelligence, is a contradiction in terms. <laughs> Whenever you need to burn something as a fuel, you know, um, there's, there's a problem with it. And whether it's burning wood, burning wood scraps in our forest industry, uh, even the idea of biofuels. Uh, currently, the US EPA uh, or, and the Department of Energy have about 15 different definitions of renewable energy. And this is one of the challenges I, I was kind of implicating, is that when you take top-down approaches uh, where uh, local governments rely on provincial governments and then federal governments and then intergovernmental bodies like the UNFCCC to define the parameters of you know, our analysis, we face these challenges. Because a lot of those international arenas are so dominated by the corporate uh, uh, by corporate control, by the industries causing climate change, but they set the definitions that, that we play with. So I would seriously ask us to rethink what we define, what we mean by renewable in the first place, uh, as as a starting point of this conversation. But uh, that said, I do I, I definitely agree with the gentleman here that I mean Andrea and the city of Vancouver have a huge role to play. I think at the last Paris uh, climate. Uh, conference, I think a lot of us kind of did the shift and went, if we shifted the focus of 99% of the advocacy groups to focusing on supporting and working with governments to, uh, to make change, that's where I think the rubber will hit the road. Uh, th these are final com comments in, in uh, response to the questions that were just posed or, or general? I think you're spot on in the sense that what we do need is a, a new approach to the Canadian Federation that actively engages local governments. We can't but help. Uh, its influence economically, socially, and ecologically is profound. Our carbon footprints are shaped by local governments. They shape the city's foot carbon footprint, the provinces, the countries. It's, it's so profound. Upwards of 50% of emissions are shaped or influenced by local government uh, decisions. Um, they should be at the table um, designing the climate plan that is 
in, is a, a work in progress, and I'm optimistic that local governments will play a much more active role. One of our biggest challenges is where the present government is going to spend its coin. Um, um, one of the biggest sources of public, growing public debt in Canada is infrastructure deficits for municipalities, and it's because of our density. It's our urban growth pattern, and the federal government agenda can exacerbate it, or they can control it, and that's once again which is a fundamental theme of this, it's around integrating um, major public policy objectives. Deficit management, um, you know, climate affordability uh, amongst the, the, some of the top ones. Public health would be another. The single biggest determinant of whether you're obese or overweight is what type of a neighborhood you live in. Cities determine that. Um, another major theme that I think has come out of this is how important dialogue is. You know, SFU has hosted this. Um, I've learned something um, from this. You guys probably have. A dialogue within city government is critical so that we, we silo bust, which is another critical um, uh, um, insight, or I think is a major theme. We have to start looking at these uh, multiple policy objectives simultaneously. And the last one, uh, Ananda, your point, which I, you know, um, it's about back to the future. So many of the solutions. Back to the future in terms of technologies, practices, and also uh, perspectives. Um, that isn't, we, only, we can't only go back to the future, we have to move forward as well, but a lot of the solutions will come from the past. The lowest carbon opportunities that are healthiest for us, um, we're standing on them every day, uh, right? From a transportation perspective, we should be moving around on it a heck of a lot more. Um, physical act inactivity and um, obesity are two of the top avoidable, um, uh, preventable um, uh, causes of, of death and disease in this country, and it's because of the way we design our cities. Um, well, I appreciate your points about the National Energy Plan. I have to admit, as you were saying that, I'm like, yeah, why haven't we done that? And I was like, oh yes, before October 19th, um, it would have been a scary proposition, right? The last thing on earth I would have wanted is a national energy strategy. <laughs> um, so, but, you know, very much worth fighting for now. Not that it's night and day, though, right? Like, it's like night and twilight right now, and, and we have to figure out how to make that daytime for us, right? Um, I have really appreciated the opportunity to, to really reflect on it, because we don't have enough space for that, right? It is, it is the always fighting, always fighting, like not each other, but fighting for this thing and not being able to take this time to kind of um, reflect as much as I feel like I, I would benefit. I think we all benefit from it. Um, I was at a, the Climate Summit of the Americas this year, um, or this past year, and there was an indigenous woman who got on stage and she said, you know, our community, she's from Northern Ontario, our communities are the most impacted by climate change. We've heard that many times. We, um, I realize we kind of just expect to hear it because the next thing she said is, and our community is most impacted by the solutions you have for climate change. Mm -hmm. And you could hear a pin drop in that room, right? Like it wasn't about us doing great things for them anymore um, or stopping screwing up their communities. It was like, wow, we screwed them up and we're still screwing them up. So how do we change the nature of this dialogue that we're having? And I think um, I've gotten a lot of good ideas today about what that like setting, I, I love this idea of setting a million climate job target along with the emissions reduction target. I love the idea of looking at research that says, in it, you know, one million climate jobs, 100% renewables or fossil fuel free, to your point, that it's not about kilojoule for kilojoule, it's about just using less energy, right? Um, not through efficiency, but because we're doing things smarter, because we don't need to bring whatever it is that we're bringing, right? Um, and, and what are the poverty, like what if the, one of the goals of the climate strategy was zero poverty, right? Like, what does that look like, and how do we integrate that? So I appreciate um, the time. I'm going to bust Ian Nebel, who's here, who is uh, one of our city staff and one of the architects of the Renewable City Strategy. So if you have highly technical questions, um, he'll put up his hand, and he is the man who can help you out with it. And thanks again for letting us have the dialogue. This is great. Yeah, join me in, in thanking our panelists. <laughs> I 
think what I've heard here are the key words are um, integration and that imperative, and that this sh this really is an opportunity. That's what I heard a lot of, which is really positive. I want to thank again our um, sponsors, SBU Center for Dialogue, North Borough Foundation, and the Pacific Institute for Climate Solutions, and all of you for joining us. This is hopefully just the beginning of future conversations, because as we all realize, it's now or never. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Thanks,